Our uh, next speaker of uh, in this session is Jim Halverson, and he'll talk about knots and natural language. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you virtually. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to, to speak and for uh, you know being OK with me talking about some other aspect of math other than algebraic geometry. I think there's a conjecture out there that if you if you're a physicist for long enough, you eventually write a, a paper on knot theory. And so here's here's mine and, uh, and Fabian and Sergey and uh, Piotr, who we also worked with, uh, have a long history in this subject. But um, we're going to try to tell you a little bit about our uh, goals in trying to understand knots in terms of natural language processing. Uh, we think it's a very natural way to think about knot theory. There's other ways to do it where you could you could map it onto various graph problems, for instance. But but we're going to think of it as natural language in this uh, in this paper and uh, generally moving forward. So I'd like to explain a little bit about that to you. Um, it's great that there's more and more interest in sort of this interface between physics and math and machine learning. I don't need to tell people at this conference <laughs> about that. Um, Many of you are aware of the things on these slides, but in case you're not, if you're looking for more ways to connect in this general area, uh, first of all, there's uh, the National Science Foundation has uh, wonderfully uh, funded the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, which I'm a part of. So in the US, uh, starting this year, there's five new NSF AI research institutes. And uh, this one that I'm a part of is uh, the only one that's at the interface with physics. Uh, but because we know that physics and math are so closely intertwined, it's, it's intertwined with mathematical things as well. This is a joint between MIT, Northeastern, Harvard, and Tufts, and it asks the questions that we're all familiar with. Can ML uh, help for physics and math discoveries? And can physics and math help ML? Um, and the reason that I mention it is that colloquia are beginning uh, uh, for the, the world to see, hopefully, starting next week. And if you're interested in that, I encourage you to sign up at ifi.org. Finally, we, uh, second, we have this Physics Meets ML, uh, which is a continuation of a meeting that we ran uh, at Microsoft Research in 2019. Some of the other organizers are in the audience. Uh, this is biweekly seminars from physicists and computer scientists from academia to industry, sometimes with even rather mathematical talks. Uh, so you can sign up at physicsmeetsml.org. And if you ever want to talk about this stuff, I'm always looking to make new friends to talk about it. So. Uh, so what I want to tell you about is uh, this paper that came out uh, fairly recently um, with, with Sergey and Pyotr and Fabian. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about a particular problem, the unknot problem in knot theory. But one of the other things we're interested in is using techniques from natural language processing. Uh, there are a couple of other knot theory and machine learning papers. They're down here uh, by Hughes, by Jajala, Carr, and Parker, and uh, by Craven, Jajala, and Carr. Um, Vishnu may be in the audience. And uh, you know these are excellent works as well. And uh, I think all of us sort of just generally are interested in machine learning and not theory, and think that this is a, a, a potentially interesting way to go. Okay, so the outline of my talk is I'm going to tell you about knots and natural language, and uh, why this is a uh, natural map to make. And I'll also review some of the biggest recent results in natural language. Uh, uh, for the purposes of motivating you to you know, recognize how powerful uh, things have become. Uh, then I'll talk about the unknot problem, and I'll set up and talk about the complexity and various aspects of the unknot problem. And I will talk about the unknot decision problem, and I will treat it with something called the reformer architecture. And some things will emerge that are kind of interesting. For instance, there's a notion of hard knot that comes out. Um, that is suggested by uh, the neural networks that we don't fully understand, but it's, it's crisp what it means, at least as far as ML goes. And then we'll talk about unknotting and reinforcement. So in particular, uh, instead of just deciding is this the unknot or not, yes or no, what you'd love to do is if you have some representation of a knot, you'd love to find the sequence of Reitermeister moves that actually shows that it's, it's trivial. And that's what we do with reinforcement learning. So that's the outline of my talk. So, so knots and natural language, why are these two things related? Uh, forgive me at the beginning, for this audience, I probably don't need such a thorough introduction of knot theory, but hopefully this means that this, this part will be easy. So here's a knot, so here's the trefoil. And um, what you can do to the trefoil is you can cut it. Now there's different places that you can cut it, but given any cut that you might have of the knot, you can imagine this as the start of a braid and as you follow these strands across the knot diagram, uh, and then you come back to the starting point, what, what you have is a braid. And in particular, the braid you have when you cut this knot this way 
is this braid here where uh, the cut line is here and this endpoint is identified with this endpoint. And this is the one of the braid representations of the trefoil knot, okay? And we write it as sigma one times sigma one times sigma one, which is this generator that uh, brings, the, brings the top strand over the bottom strand and it just acts three times. So uh, it, in particular, given that this is sigma one, sigma one, sigma one, we can just write it as sigma one, sigma one, sigma one. So we have this way of taking this knot and representing it as, as a word in this generator. Of course, um, these are, uh, oh, sorry, another way that I should say it is that the knot is the closure of this braid. So this braid is an object in and of itself, but if you close it around, it, back, it becomes the knot again. And that comes by identifying the endpoints. Okay. So, so uh, there's the Artan braid group. Uh, there's the identity, which is represented this way. Uh, of course, there are inverses. So if I have sigma one inverse bringing this strand up here and sigma one brings it back, this is a topologically trivial operation overall. So inverses exist. You can, uh, you can take this generator and this generator and compose it into this general thing. And it's associative as well. So the braid group is, uh, is uh, a braid group on these Artan braid generators. And uh, those are the objects of our study. Now there's braid equivalence also. This, there's equivalence relations in, in this braid group. So in particular, uh, if I have sigma one acting and then sigma three and then sigma two, this is topologically equivalent to sigma three acting, then sigma one, then sigma two. Put differently, uh, sigma one and sigma three commute. Some of the generators commute, or more generally, uh, the generators commute whenever their difference is, uh, uh, the absolute value of their difference is greater than one. Okay. And then there's, uh, there's a second uh, braid relation where sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i is sigma i plus one, sigma i, sigma i plus one. That's represented by uh, this diagram, and this is the second braid relation. So this is, this is about braids. This is about equivalences of braids. But if I can have braids and I can close them uh, into knots, then you can ask, are there things that you can do to braids that change the braid but preserve the structure and the topology of its closure? It's not, okay? So that's not equivalence. So uh, the not equivalence is encoded in Markov moves on the braids, uh, which become Reitermeister moves and, uh, of the knots. And so this Markov move here, uh, is a Markov move that's called conjugation, uh, where basically you can see, um, uh, you, you, yeah, so, so what you do is you conjugate the braid word by, uh, by some element of the Artan braid group uh, with opposite signs. And what happens is that in the closure, when you do that, that opposite signedness, if you brought it around in the closure, those two operations would cancel out. And so what this allows you to do is to do something like take this braid word element and bring it to the end. Uh, by a conjugation. Okay, now then there's something else called stabilization, where you imagine that you originally have a braid, uh, a braid like this, but then you take this new strand. This new strand isn't a part of this original braid, and you weave in this new strand. That is changing the braid, but again, if you imagine the closure of this whole thing, you see that this new strand that I've weaved in, when you take the closure, if this comes around, it just forms a loop that you can untwist. And so they're equivalent knots, even though the braids are inequivalent. That's called stabilization. And these are Markov moves. So braid relations are equivalences amongst braids. Markov moves are mapping one braid to another braid, but subject to the condition that the closures are equivalent knots. Okay, but, but this is all sort of standard braid theory and knot theory. The upshot is, is that when we think of knots as braids, they're represented by words. And knot equivalence becomes equivalences between different words. And so it sort of begs the question, how do we determine when two words carry the same meaning, uh, or in language, when two sentences carry the same meaning? So thought of this way, when we want to talk about braid and knot equivalence or various different problems in, in, in knot theory by using their braid representatives, this is the machine learning area of natural language processing. So it's sequence data, and we want to take some of these techniques that are used in natural language and apply it to braid theory and not theory. Okay. So now, uh, okay, so there's some famous results in natural language processing. I'll mention a, a simple one that's old and a newer one that's uh, impressive. So one thing that natural language can do is uh, uh, learn semantics. 
So if you have a word embedding, if E is a map that embeds words into a vector space, sometimes what you find with some learned embedding E is that uh, the E of king minus E of man plus E of woman is equal to E of queen or approximately equal to E of queen as vectors. But more recently, there's these generative language models, uh, for instance, this very famous GPT-3. Uh, and on the right-hand side, what we have is an example of, of a GPT prompt. So what, what this is, is this, this is results from this summer. Um, the bold is a human written prompt, and that is fed to GPT-3 that gen then generates the rest of the text. So below is a screenplay for a film noir hard-boiled detective story by Raymond So-and-so about the boy wizard Harry Potter, Harry Potter by Raymond Chandler. That's what's fed into the machine. And then what GPT gives is Harry Potter, private eye, scene, a small dingy office, early morning, furniture of the Salvation Army store variety, sorted atmosphere, and so on. At the end, it actually gets kind of funny. A young man in a double-breasted gray suit is leaning against the building. Harry sighs again and goes out the door. He walks up to the young man and without ceremony punches him in the jaw. And so interestingly, there's actually in this passage not a whole lot about the wizardness, but it's sort of got the detective story film noir style down pat. And uh, this is an impressive thing, I think. So GPT-3, look it up. There's all sorts of fascinating examples over the internet. And this is one of the biggest results in natural language processes in 2020. In our context, what we would hope that natural uh, process, what natural language processing can do is to learn commutivity. So for instance, uh, he's sometimes right is equal to sometimes he's right. So if you change the order of words in the sentence, sometimes it carries the same meaning, but uh, other times it doesn't commute. So the scientist eats the chicken is not equal to the chicken eats the scientist, right? Um, Furthermore, uh, you might hope that it learns equivalences. So uh, these equivalences here are um, the sorts of equivalences that we have under these Markov moves. So this is conjugation, and this is this stabilization. And these are equivalences that arise in the braid theory context. And you, you, you would hope that uh, this natural language processing can learn, uh, can learn these, these equivalences. OK, so that's the setup. That's why it's natural to think about uh, braid representatives of knots in terms of natural language, or more generally, really any group theory problem that you care about where you think of it as words, it's natural to think about it um, in terms of natural language. And um, that's just a generally an interesting direction to go. Uh, we have many hopes and dreams uh, generally about knot theory, but what I'm going to describe to you today is a very, very simple problem. It's the unknot problem. It's a simple to state but difficult to solve tangling problem. And it's sort of a first step in applying some of these techniques for us. So the unknot problem is the following. Is a given knot K the unknot? Here it is. Uh, this is some complicated knot. Uh, but it actually, if you follow it through, it is the unknot. And in particular, it's not equal to the trefoil. You might hope that it would be easy to solve this problem, to problem using knot invariance. But uh, to mention some famous knot invariants, so the Alexander polynomial is one for the unknot. It can be computed quickly, but the converse is not true. So the Alexander polynomial will not decide the unknot. The Jones polynomial, on the other hand, is one for the unknot, but the converse is not known to be true. It is true for up to knots with, with 24 crossings. Um, so so it's, not true. it's not really known whether the Jones polynomial decides, decides the unknot or not. But unfortunately, the Jones polynomial is sharp p hard, which is a uh, complexity class that is even harder than n p hard. So this is not an easy thing to compute. In particular, as the as the uh, number of crossings of the knot uh, goes up, uh, the the you're going to have exponential time complexity for computing the Jones polynomial. Uh, similarly, Kovanov homology does detect the unknot, but it's also slow. And in particular, if it were fast, it would contradict uh, it would contradict the sharp p hardness of the Jones polynomial, which can be uh, can be obtained from the Kovanov homology. Okay, so the punchline is is that there's no fast knot invariant that detects the unknot. Okay, um, we're also not that great at detecting the unknot. So uh, I, I had my uh, first kid last year, and as part of it, I've been thinking about games for children. And so uh, in our paper, we have this fun appendix where we talk about this game, not or not, a game for children. And we have these knot diagrams, and you, the goal is to give them to your children, and they need to tell you whether or not it's topologically trivial. Okay. So this is a case with a low number of crossings. You can look at this diagram pretty quickly and in your head, you can untangle it, yeah? So that's the unknot. If you stare at this one for a little while, what you'll realize is that that can't be untangled and it's because it's a non-trivial knot, okay? On the other hand, uh, these two down here, one of them is the knot 
and one of them is the undot, and it would be very hard to do it uh, in your head for certain. And in particular, the, the, the point that this is making is that it's obvious to humans that the difficulty of detecting the not or unnot is going up with the number of crossings. So uh, the answer in this case is that this is the unnot and this is the not. In particular, uh, a good bit is known about the complexity of the unnot problem. So there's this great paper by Lackenby from, from last year uh, that has a survey of many different results in this direction. And maybe some of them are original results too. I, I should know that. Uh, one way to do this would be to uh, say, given a representative of a knot, try all possible combinations of Reitermeister moves, but that complexity is just going up exponentially in the number of crossings. So this is an exponential time procedure. Um, more generally, the complexity of the unknot problem, it, it is known to be an NP. That's an old result from the late 90s. Um, it's also in co-NP. Um, and uh, what this means is that it's probably not NP complete because uh, it, th so, so this problem is in NP intersect co NP and, um, and uh, right. So, so this is at odds. Um, so, so I'm going to get this wrong. Yeah. So it means it's probably not NP complete since then NP is equal to co NP, which is the opposite of, of the consensus. Uh, in complexity theory, there's these various consensuses in the field. Certainly the consensus is that P is not equal to NP, uh, and these are sort of in the backs of people's minds. But, but there's still open questions about the unmap problem. So is this problem in P like primes? So, so the problem of determining whether an integer or prime is prime or not uh, was actually shown to be a polynomial time problem in 2002 uh, by Agrawal, Kyle, and Saxena. Uh, but then there's other problems that may not be in P, but are in BQP, like factorizing integers, as, as shown by, by Shor. So that's, that's a, a bounded quantum polynomial time. So, uh, or it could be something else entirely. But, but there's various things known about the complexity of this problem. But we're going to take a practical, practical approach of just trying to solve it with machine learning. And so first, we're going to set up the decision problem of just answering yes or no. And then we're going to turn to reinforcement learning. So the question is, can neural networks decide the unknot problem? And in particular, do modern natural language processing architectures help? OK, so we have ways to generate data, of course. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll be brief, and I won't walk through the details of these algorithms. So our prior that, uh, from which we draw unknots basically starts with the empty braid word and then does a bunch of random Markov moves and braid relations to build up some complicated braid representative that is actually the unknot. And the reason it's the unknot is because we started with something trivial and we built up something non trivial. On the other hand, uh, we have a way of generating knots by basically just sampling sequences of integers. And then uh, generally, that will give you a link when you take that sequence of integers and think of it as a braid word. Generally, it will give you a link. And what you can do is you can glue those components together in a way uh, that, that produces a non-trivial knot. And we compute some topological invariance to ensure that it's non-trivial. Okay. So we have ways to uh, sample knots and unknots. It's, uh, if you'd like, it's a, a prior distribution on the space of knots and unknots that we have. And so we have, we have these, these uh, algorithms for generating data. So for many different numbers of crossings, we generated thousands of examples. But when I, what I want to show you is a little bit of information about uh, our ensembles at low crossing numbers. So in particular, there's a nice fact that knots with nine or fewer with nine or fewer crossings are detected by their Jones polynomial, and therefore, uh, if you sample from our priors for n less than or equal to nine, what you can do is map these onto the uh, Rolfson table of prime knots with less than or equal to nine crossings. And uh, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, the trefoil uh, arises a lot, uh, despite the fact that we generated larger knots. Um, Given this prior, we're going to do something with it. We're going to use something called uh, called reformers, which are an uh, uh, are a refinement of the att attention mechanism in natural language processing. So the uh, attention mechanism is a very very famous paper from 2017. I think it has like something like 15,000 citations already, which is something that just does not happen at the same rate in physics. Uh, there's this famous paper uh, by Viswani et al. And the basic idea of the attention mechanism is to learn what in the sequence is carrying the most meaning, that is to pay attention to it. The idea behind the reformer, uh, these uh, transformer architectures associated with the atten attention mechanism can actually be very complicated to train in the sense that they take a lot of time. So there was this paper from uh, last year called Reformer, the Efficient Transformer, that gave uh, really good gains. Uh, it's an attention-like mechanism that uses something called locality-sensitive hashing. 
that uh, basically allows you on a single GPU, if you, if you don't have infinite compute, a single GPU on a desktop can, can still uh, get pretty good performance. So we're using the reformer architecture. So um, very good. Uh, yes, good. I'm just checking my timing in my head. So, so this, this, is, this is the reformer architecture. And uh, in particular, the full attention in this plot is the transformer. Uh, these dotted lines are different numbers of locality sensitive hashes that you use in the reformer. What you can see is as you crank up the number of locality sensitive hashes, you're starting to uh, approach the performance of the full attention model, which uh, takes more time. So this is an approximation to the attention mechanism, if you'd like, that is fast. Okay. So what we're trying to do is the binary, first we're doing the binary classification problem on unknot decision. So what we did was we trained on thousands of knots with different numbers of crossings. And uh, these are our results. Uh, a couple of comments that I would like to make is that the natural language processing model here, the reformer, you can see that it does better than a feed forward net, but actually kind of just barely. So I think one of the lessons that uh, collectively, uh, those of us here that, that know each other pretty well, one of the things we've learned collectively as a community in the last three years is that sometimes the problems we think are hard are actually relatively easy for ML and a simple feed forward net does way better than you would expect. So while I do think that these NLP techniques are going to be important for knot theory in the long run, for the unknot problem, feed forward nets are already doing quite well. Um, a second thing to point out is that reformers and transformers are doing pretty well. So this is the efficient thing that's an approximation. This is the, the architecture from the attention is all you need paper. And what you can see is that the full attention cases are not doing so much better necessarily. A surprising thing is that the performance is going up with the number of crossings. Uh, so as you see, this is 12, 24, 36, 48 crossings, uh, where it's correctly identifying whether or not a representative is the unknot. Uh, but one of the things that we realized is that uh, that was in the case where we had a fixed number of words. But if you fix the overall number of letters so that is seen, the, the overall number of generators that's seen by the network, the split isn't quite so big. But still, there's the kind of this unintuitive thing where uh, the performance does seem to be going up with the number of crossings. OK, so this, I, I realize I'm throwing a smattering of results at you. Uh, hopefully, some of them are interesting. Another thing that we looked into is whether you can see topological invariance emerge naturally from this problem, and also whether there's notions of hardness. OK, so let's start with hardness. At right, what we have um, is the distribution of knots and unknots, the output. So knots are labeled zero and unknots are labeled one. Yes. So this is correctly identifying unknots up here, and this is correctly identifying knots. But you'll notice that there are some cases where uh, I have not outputs that are at the opposite end of the spectrum. So this is not a case where the network uh, is unsure of its prediction. It's actually quite sure of its prediction, but it's making the wrong prediction, OK? So you might start to ask, if I define that to be the hardness of a knot, does that persist across different initializations of the network, right? So uh, is it true that the same types of knots that get confidently mislabeled continue to get confidently mislabeled if you use different initializations? And that's true. So for instance, we started with 1,000 uh, braids with less than or equal to nine crossings. There's 30 hard instances there that are consistently and confidently mislabeled uh, across, across multiple different tests. Uh, and 19 of them turn out to be trefoils, despite the fact that only a quarter of the knots are trefoils. So, so, so 2 thirds of the trefoils seem to be very hard, uh, even though only a quarter of the overall knots are hard. So, it's kind of preliminary data, but somehow it suggests that knots with fewer crossings uh, are actually kind of hard to, to, to understand here. Finally, the thing that I'd like to point out is uh, there's Jones polynomial correlations that emerge. So what we did was we took our knots and we wanted to compute uh, what the output was and take the, the output and take the mean of the log 10. So think of this as uh, a measure of the confidence. Uh, a, the network is confident about knots as you move south. And what we have on the x-axis is the, uh, the Jones polynomial degree. So the higher the Jones polynomial degree, we compute it after the fact it's not used in training, the more confident the network is about its prediction. So this is uh, one of these cases that we hope to see in the long run of uh, topological invariant correlations coming out rather than being put in. Okay. But that's just the decision problem. Really what I, what I want to talk about and finish with is uh, the more interesting problem, which isn't can you decide yes or no. The more interesting problem is 
given a braid representative of a knot, can you find the sequence of moves that untangles it efficiently? Or I'm sorry, given a braid representative of the unknot, can you find the sequence of moves that untangles it efficiently? So this is the area of reinforcement learning in machine learning. Um, and we want to ask, can reinforcement learning learn to find those sequences of moves? OK, so reinfor in reinforcement learning, we have an agent that acts in an environment. OK, so it's, it's not just like a normal ML application. We have an agent in an environment, like this little robot. Uh, it perceives a state from state space, S. OK, and it has a policy function, pi, that is a map from states to actions. Okay, so the policy is something that, given the state, tells you what action to take. It might be stochastic, so it might probabilistically tell you what, what, what action to take. But after taking uh, the step, the robot, the agent, arrives in a new state and receives a reward. The successive rewards accumulate via this sum into something called the return, and future re rewards are, are penalized by something called the discount factor. So this is a notion of having behavioral reinforcement come into the game so that notions of goodness and badness are fed to the agent. And the name of the game in reinforcement learning is how do you take this information and uh, do updates that change, that change the policy? So there's different ways to do that. And sometimes they involve things called the, the, uh, the state value function or the action value function. The, the key thing is using behavioral reinforcement to teach uh, a, a robot how to act. A famous example of this is uh, alpha zero. So um, the, uh, in, in the biggest results here, this was not alpha go. Alpha zero was an even better follow-up. This was reinforcement learning with no human data, where on chess, shogi, and go, uh, the RL agent was taught, uh, taught itself um, how to play intelligently given just the rules of the game. So it was not given any supervised games to train on. It was not given any human data. It's just a general reinforcement learning algorithm that, that can master these games. Okay. One thing I should point out here that I'll mention in our not cases is that uh, by, by studying rollouts in reinforcement learning, you can actually get some notion of interpretability that comes into the game. So for example, in chess, this is something called the Caro Khan defense. And uh, it was in the middle of training, it was played quite frequently, about 10% of the time, but at the beginning and the end, it wasn't played that regularly. But the way that it determines this is that at any given point in the training process, you can take the policy neural network roll out trajectories of the game through the state space of chess and see what opening the, uh, it learns to play. So, so that's one nice thing about, about reinforcement learning is that you can get at interpretability by studying rollouts. So how do we unknot with reinforcement learning? Our state space in this case is zero padded braids of length 2n. The action space has dimension n plus 5. There are various actions that we take. You can shift left, you can shift right. You can do a braid rela relation and then shift right. You can do a braid relation of the other type and shift right. You can do a Markov move of type one, uh, which is uh, conjugating by an arbitrary generator. And there's something that we call smart collapse that we allow it to do also. Since we're trying to take the braid, which we know ahead of time is an unknot and shrink it down to nothing uh, via these moves, a good reward is the negative braid length. End of game in our, in our setup occurs either when you hit the empty braid, that is, that's, that's like beating Bowser, you've won the game. Or if you do 300 moves and you haven't solved the problem yet, that's, that's called timeout and we start over, okay? So that's the way the game ends. There are a couple of different RL algorithms that we use that I can go into. Uh, this trust region policy optimization does much better than the others, um, but, uh, but those are details. So here are the results. What we're doing is feeding unknots to these agents and letting them train themselves to, to unknot intelligently. And uh, the three algorithms, we have two reinforcement learning algorithms, but we also have a, uh, a random walker. And what the random walker is doing is sampling actions from a uniform prior on, on action space. So it's just taking random actions. So what we study here is we study the accuracy versus braid length. Accuracy means what percentage of unknots were successfully unknotted. So we have some long representative of the unknot and the agent is trying to collapse it down to nothing. What we see is that at, at initialization for, for all three different types of algorithms, uh, th sorry, this is, this is a little ways in, this is just barely started training. Uh, we see that A3C and TRPO are up around 80% ac I misspoke, this is not time, this is braid length. This is the crucial thing, this is braid length. Accuracy versus braid length. So, uh, right, so, so for low N, 
uh, we see that a random walker is already doing pretty well, successfully unknotting about 65% of the examples where the RL is doing something like 80%. But as we increase N, you would expect, as you increase the number of crossings in your braid representative, you would imagine that a random walker is gonna do very, very poorly. And indeed, you sort of see this, this uh, large fall off in the green dots and it's doing worse and worse. On the other hand, A3C, which is one RL algorithm is doing better. But what's kind of remarkable is that this trust region policy optimization is relatively flat as a function of n. So for braids of length 10 or something like that, it's already getting 80% of them correct. But even up at braids of length 100 or something like that, it's still getting about 80% correct. So this is a good example of the sorts of gains that you can get using techniques for machine learning to solve some of these discrete optimization tasks. The other thing that I want to mention is that given any of these trained reinforcement learning agents, you can study interpretability of what it's doing, at least in simple cases, you can be more detailed too, you can do it via rollout. What I mean is, um, what, what we should think of is that learning itself in this context is a flow of the state dependent distribution on action space. That is, um, that is the policy function is flowing as a function. And what's happening is that the probability distribution on actions is changing as le learning occurs. So what you can ask is, um, a concrete question is, how does the probability distribution on actions change between the initial agent and the final agent? So at initialization, uh, the agents are sampling from uniform, and you can see that these untrained agents are doing the different types of actions about the same number of times. But what you can see is that the trained agent does some moves far more than the others. And in our paper, we talk at some length about how to understand that, but I'll just mention two cases now. Uh, smart collapse is done pretty regularly, and this is actually the only uh, action that we have that reduces the number of crossings directly. So that directly gives a reward. So it makes sense that it likes doing that. There's this interesting as asymmetry between shifting left and shifting right. Um, one of the reasons is, is that the way we set up our actions is that the braid relations include some shifts to the right um, for reasons that are, that are technical and detailed. So what that means is that you get many shifts to the right for free. So there's no real incentive for the agent to choose a move that's just shift right. And that, that explains this huge asymmetry between shifting left and shifting right. There's more interpretation in the paper. But this is one of the general rules of thumb in reinforcement learning that humans can sometimes understand the rollouts just like we do when we watch Alpha Zero play chess. You know, it might be that when we study rollouts of the unknot problem, we, we can understand it. So this is one of the more concrete cases of interpretability in machine learning. All right, I'm almost out of time. I'd like to leave a few minutes for questions. So let me conclude. The point is, is that natural language processing techniques are natural for knot theory. We use these reformer architectures and uh, something called a shared QK transformer. If you're looking for cool things to look up to see great progress, just Google GPT-3 examples and see what's out there. And what we tackled this with was, uh, what we tackled with this was the unknot decision problem. There's a lot of complexity results uh, and we generated data by defining a prior, and in some cases that were possible, we mapped it onto the Rolfson table. What we found is that these reformers do better than feedforward neural networks, but the feedforward neural networks still do surprisingly well, which suggests that this problem is easier than people might anticipate. We also saw that notions of hardness of knots emerged naturally, something that was suggested by ML, but we would like to be able to understand um, uh, sort of more systematically. Uh, there's well, okay, so there's some interesting knot theory literature about that recently, also about the Conway knot, for instance. Uh, finally, in reinforcement learning, the agent is learning to alter its behavior. The, the environment is that the states are braids, the actions are braid and Markov moves that we compose. The rewards are the negative braid length and the goal is to unknot the braid. What we find is that uh, trust region policy optimization performs wonderfully and the performance is relatively flat in N. So it does equally well on 100 crossing knots as 10 crossing knots. And uh, we also showed that you can interpret some of this structure via studying rollouts of the trained agents. Okay, so that's it. Thanks a lot. I have four minutes left, which hopefully lets me answer a few questions. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, so we have time for uh, questions. Maybe a question if possible. Sure. Uh, it's a bit uh, like what you described here, it sounds like you could actually try to apply it to other mathematical contexts and maybe try to compare other, let's say equivalence relations and quotients or something like that. Uh, do you have anything in mind maybe that you might want to do? Um, so do you, mean, do you mean the reinforcement learning type of thing? 
no even the uh, the whole uh, first thing which was about different uh, i don't know words written and uh, like because yeah. uh, you could for example try to localize categories i guess oh i have not I mean, thought about that um yeah perhaps um so 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 the, indeed you're catching on one of the points that i was trying to make that any time in math we have some sort of sequence structure that is of interest to us so so beyond just uh beyond just braids and knots these word problems arise in group theory all the time. Anytime you have this sort of sequence structure, it's natural to try to apply these natural language processing techniques. Um, I did it sort of in two different ways, this reinforcement learning style versus the supervised learning decision problem style. But yeah, I mean, I, th I think that that's a, that's a natural direction to, to go in. So um, uh, yeah, I haven't thought about the category case, but uh, in the context of, uh, uh, of group theory, I think it's very natural. So. There's a uh, question in the chat. Oh, yes. Uh, so you can see it. you see it, Jim? I can't see it because I'm full screen. And OK, perfect. So I'll read it to you. Uh, so you design the environment to give reward at each state action on reinforcement learning. How did you do that? Yes, good. Uh, I think part of the question is, sounds like you had to make some choices. Um, yeah, so, so, so in this case, when you do reinforcement learning, um, you, you might, I mean, one way to think about it is to think about how would you solve it yourself. If you had some long braid, you would start doing some moves that you know are equivalences, but you would like to have some notion of good or bad, right? So, so uh, the thing that's good is the, the, that the, uh, that the uh, braid is shrinking down. So in this case, we chose the reward to be uh, the negative braid length. So instead, one should really think of that as a punishment. So you get punished by the length of the braid. And as the braid gets shorter, the punishment you receive is less and less. So there's definitely a, a choice to be made there. And part of doing this concretely um, requires thinking about it a little bit. There's a famous example uh, in the reinforcement learning textbooks, even going back 30 years, that's similar in spirit. And, and the question is, what reward do you give to a robot if you're trying to solve a maze, right? So one way to do that is to say, anytime you take a step, do zero unless you do get zero reward, unless you get out of the maze and then you give it one. The problem with that is it's a problem of delayed rewards. You don't get the reward until the very end. And furthermore, if you take a very long path out of the maze and a very short path out of the maze, you get the same reward, which is one. So in the maze context, the better reward is to actually give it a punishment of minus one for every step that it takes. And then the game is over when it's done. And that encourages you to find the shortest path or a shorter path at least. Similarly here, we, uh, one of the choices that we made was to take the negative braid length, um, which is the analog of the punishment. So the state space is kind of obvious given the problem. We have some braids that are uh, representing the unknot. The action space is the, is, is the space of things that you can do uh, that um, you know, preserve the knot topology. We did have to make some clever choices. There were some false steps in environment design before we got something that worked. But um, yeah, th that's, th these are the sorts of things that enter the game. So one that's of great. the things you want to keep action space dimension down. So yeah. that's great. Uh, so let's uh, thank Jim again. So.